What if there is no intrinsic meaning to the universe? Quiver whispers it. Well, Mick replies, that would explain everything. Ricky Ducournay's latest novel catapulted me into the future and made me nostalgic for my life here on Earth. Ricky Ducournay had a bunch of really close friends growing up. They were all words. In Ducournay's latest novel, a robot can suffer a glottological rust rash. In Ducournay's latest book, she gives us a catchy little tune that mixes science and innuendo and rivals the sleazy science teacher slash gym teacher early on in Gaddis's JR. Can I entice you to read this by one sentence from the book? On top of all this, due to a dysplastic tear, they are startled nearly out of their wits by a thoroughly unpleasant tinkwood shuffle, causing their atoms to discompose, if but for a quick in time, which reduces them to a fluid extracellular hyperpromiscuity, cellular decoherence. In other words, their latitudinal diversity gradients are smacked. Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today, I'm excited to talk about Ricky Ducournay's newest novel, Traffic. This is another one from Coffee House Press. Her last book, Bright Fellow, also came out from Coffee House Press, and I happen to have done a video on that. I'll link to it below. I really need to do a video on all of her books uh, because Ricky Ducournay is one of those writers who stands at the forefront of my mind when I think about books that are like comfort foods where, you know, I go and read all this other stuff, you know, and I explore and I try to push the boundaries of what I know, but there's that set group of books and authors. Uh, and for me, that includes uh, a lot of authors that, of course, I've talked about a lot on this channel, like Gaddis and Pinchon, William T. Volman. Uh, but then there are these others that are e even deeper because I discovered them uh, first. You know, Ricky Ducournay is in there. Also, I would, I would have to say Philip Roth is in there. Marilyn Robinson is in there. Uh, and a handful of others. Henry James, I can think of. These are authors that I discovered uh, really early on and that still speak to me and that I'd come back to, even if it's just to uh, dip into their books every now and then. And so Du Cornet, I mean, the first uh, material I read of hers was her Tetralogy of Elements. Uh, this is The Stain, Entering Fire, Fountains of Neptune, and The Jade Cabinet. Fountains of Neptune and The Jade Cabinet are my favorite Ricky Du Cornet books. I mentioned some things about them in both the Bright Fellow video and also, I think, either 10 short books I love or it might be 10 uh, opening lines that I, that I love. So when I finally got a chance uh, to read this, Coffee House Press was generous enough to send me not one, but two copies. Uh, so as you can see in the title of this video, I'm going to be giving uh, the copy that I did not mark up uh, and tab away. So uh, please stick around to the end of the video to hear how to enter into that drawing. When I first received it and saw that it was only 88 pages. Now, Goodreads and other places uh, deceptively say it's something like 120 pages, but it is uh, exactly 88 pages of story text here. That's fine. It's Ricky Ducournay. You know, just like uh, DeLillo fans, they were fine with the silence. But speaking of DeLillo and the silence and, and a lot of his later work, you know, there's always this fear or concern with authors that we love and authors whom we've followed throughout their career, you know, that they, they're going to lose it, right? Or that they're going to try to change up so drastically that they lose that ness that makes up, you know, Du Cornet-ness and DeLillo-ness. Uh, and a lot of people have complained, you know, that ever, ever since uh, Underworld, uh, DeLillo's DeLillo-ness uh, has kind of fled. And so, you know, I worried about that with traffic, but I can say that once again, Du Cornet, she nails it. I mean, at first I was, uh, I was thinking as I was reading into it and, and, you know, wading into the pool, I thought to myself, Oh, Ricky, what are you doing here? Uh, but then all of a sudden she just 
turned it on and for the rest of the journey. I mean, it's just perfect. Ricky Ducourne, uh, her ability to craft language, um, but then also her extremely fertile imagination. The two of these, allow her to do anything she wants. And even with this sort of sci-fi tale in here, it sort of reminded me of a Black Mirror episode. You know, she takes this and she constructs this world of hers and, you know, it's these uh, two beings who are uh, zipping around in outer space. Um, even within those constraints, the trademark Du Cornet as a seriously gifted writer still shines through. We have two main characters here. Quiver is sort of a like transitional being. She's sort of in between a full human uh, and an AI. She was born and raised on the moon. Uh, she, she never did experience life on Earth because Earth is completely gone now. There are these different stages that, that are talked about in this book that led up to the complete demise and eradication of Earth. But nonetheless, because Quiver is, was born in what's called an envelope, she was an envelope child, she has these artificial memories that were given to her, uh, and now she has you know, a full consciousness that goes on with those memories, and uh, she's not fully you know, uh, synthetic. Therefore, you know, she's a transitional being. What grows out of this, interestingly, is a sense of loss for a place that she never knew firsthand. Now, she is also going around the universe as uh, an excavator or uh, an archeologist who you know, is sent to these different places to uh, cultivate, or not to cultivate, but to collect some of the minerals and whatever and bring them back to her home base on planet elsewhere in order to keep her company and to keep her from really breaking down and to make sure that she stays on track um, they've given her this full AI who goes by the name of Mick, which is short for Michelangelo. This full uh, AI really disdains being called a gizmo. And it's funny to watch them bicker. It's just the two of them on this ship, which they call a wobble. There's all kinds of playful vocabulary in here. I mean, this is Ricky Ducournay. But anyhow, it's funny to, to see them get into it and they bicker and fight and call each other names. And she'll, you know, come at him, talk, you know, berating him or upbraiding him and that's what really gets him is when she calls him just nothing but a tool or a machine or a gizmo but then he has these moments where he's like oh i just had a rev revelation quiver you know um if if we are because we think in other words you know this is a nod to descartes uh cogito ergo sum or uh je pense donc je suis i think because uh, therefore i am uh then i am a thought then I'm nothing but a thought, really, and therefore I am. I am a being. And, you know, at first this seems basic, you know, stuff most people have heard, I think, therefore I am, even if they don't know who to whom to attribute it. But from that one little seed, Du Cornet goes on to develop that. Uh, and I'm telling you, at first I thought that this wasn't going to have a lot of meat to it, not just because it's trim at 88 pages, um, but this is Du Cornet having fun. She's just having a good time. And that comes through on every page. But about halfway through, and then for the rest of the book, she punches through into this depth of thought and idea that I really didn't expect. And what happens is it ends on a note of hope. And, you know, I, especially in the realm of sci-fi, you read so many books where basically human beings are despicable and we're just junk, you know, and we're trashing the earth, we trash our own bodies, and, you know, we're horrible and all this. We need to flee to another galaxy, and somehow, you know, everything will be all right uh, if we start over. But she ends on a very hopeful note, and a, a huge argument, much to my pleasure, in favor of books and libraries. As Mick and Quiver are going around in these different places, they accidentally lose all their cargo and they know they're, go they're going to be uh, in big trouble. So they decide to go rogue and then set for this famous planet called Traffic. This is sort of like a utopia or something like that. And they're both like, yes, let's go there. And on their journey there, and then especially when they get there, they have these experiences that result in 
epiphanies for each of them, for both Mick and for Quiver. But as they're going there, they stop at these different places, and we see that over and over, these places have been abandoned. And it shows this inherent restlessness within us, this drive to find something new and to start something and try to create a civilization or whatever, but this inherent restlessness that stirs up. So restlessness and this sense of loss are seemingly inescapable, even for a synthetic being. Listen to this writing. Sailing faster than light, yet in their bubble they can still see the light, and seemingly motionless, looking up into the eye of the plonk sidereal atlas in silence. They sit back, as in all directions bright things in the throes of darkest night, things made of shadow and light, things having succumbed to shadow, having resurged from seas of helium ashes, from forests of kinetic misfortune, having survived mournful wastelands of formaldehyde, perished in inclement estuaries of psychoactive salts slide past. This is classic Du Cornet. I mean, that sounds like something out of the Jade Cabinet or the Fountains of Neptune. Mick, the uh, AI or the robot, is addicted to learning about. He's obsessed with pop culture. He's obsessed with Al Pacino and the closets of Hollywood celebrities. But there's this moment where he suddenly feels that something is missing. He's soaking up all of this popular culture and all of these facts and all of this data and information, but there's something more that he wants. He goes up to Quiver and asks her to, to tell him uh, about something that really what he means is something that's charged with human emotion, not just raw data. Right from the first page, we're brought in medias race into the middle of this world that she's constructed. Uh, like most of her books, it's a little bit disorienting, but over time, I would say that really, Traffic is probably her most accessible work in terms of following a narrative and a backstory. Uh, she seems to be sticking closer to exposition um, without the loss of her literary value. We know what's going on the whole time, and right on the first page, we have Julio Cortazar. She uses his prose poem, from the observatory to drive a lot of this book that she has constructed here. So in the course of all this fun that Du Cornet is having, I mean, it, ble it really does come through on every page and you just sit there and grin as a reader, just enjoying this work that the author so clearly enjoyed. I mean, you've got Mick and Quiver getting at each other all the time and Quiver refers to Mick as bot-splaining things to her, a great twist on mansplaining, and then he berates her for being, you know, for humans being faulty inventions, and I mean, they're zipping around, and all these different words, like the word wobble for a spacecraft, and uh, the word quick minus the C, to talk about a, a measurement of time, then constantly, it just, she goes deep on you, she just hits these depths it's amazing how Du Cornet can go from one emotion to the other. And then finally, where do we land? Thus far, it seems Earth was the only place in the galaxies where books flourished. I highly recommend Ricky Du Cornet's latest novel from Coffeehouse Press, Traffic. It is a treat, it is a fun read, and it is re-readable. Now for the free giveaway. All you have to do is put a comment below and you'll be entered and I will pick a winner within a week uh, and get in touch with you and ship this to you. It is open worldwide, no need to be only in the US. Uh, so wherever you are, if you don't have this book, go ahead and enter because you will want to read this latest treat from Ricky Ducournay.